What makes the perfect kaiju sequence? Often, your answer to that question is going to depend on your answer to the question, what type of kaiju fan are you? There are a few different camps when it comes to answering that. Some of us are fans of the more serious and grounded kaiju films that center around the human response to giant monsters. Others of us are more interested in the bombastic monster-on-monster -monster brawls, and some of us just like big monsters. Depending on where you land on this spectrum will determine your answer to what makes the perfect kaiju sequence but to me, the answer is a little more complex. In order to have the perfect kaiju sequence, we must first understand what makes the perfect action sequence. A few years ago, Film Mento made a video on Mission Impossible Fallout detailing how the film created the perfect scene. This is a fantastic video that I couldn't agree more with. In the video, Film Mento lays out four key points that help to create the perfect sequence, and they are choice, time, twist, and theme. He details how these four components of a scene help to elevate it to higher levels, and to me, these are some of the key components needed to create the perfect kaiju sequence as well. They aren't the only ingredients, and there are many different things that can be done to create the perfect scene, but their usefulness can't be understated. To explain his philosophies, we'll take a look at previous kaiju films that use these concepts incredibly well. Recently, I did a video discussing the vast potential for Kong to have one of the greatest kaiju storylines ever put to film in the upcoming Godzilla x Kong The New Empire. One of the moments I highlighted as an example of how to make an impactful kaiju scene came from 2021's Godzilla vs. Kong. The scene where Kong awakens after his defeat at the hands of Godzilla to find himself stranded in Antarctica with nowhere to go and only Gia to trust is fantastic. This scene uses the concept of choice very effectively to demonstrate the depths of Kong's loneliness and propel his character from a passive to active protagonist. After resisting entrance to the Hollow Earth, Kong is told that there's a chance he might find others like himself down below. Low, and in an instant, Kong makes his first active choice of the movie and sprints into the Hollow Earth after bellowing a pained cry. Kong's choice to enter the Hollow Earth is the crux of the scene, and his decision to look for his family is its climax. This scene is truly heartbreaking to think about and is very well handled. The next point on Filmento's list is time. As Alfred Hitchcock famously explained, a mundane conversation between two people at a table is boring. If a bomb suddenly goes off and kills them, it's a surprise. This moment is effective at moving the audience, but only for a second. However, a mundane conversation between two people at a table where it's revealed that there is a ticking time bomb beneath them is suddenly suspenseful, dragging out the audience's emotions over the course of the entire scene and elevating everything within it. This doesn't always need to be a literal bomb, but it doesn't hurt when it is. One example of a film that does this very well is Godzilla 2014. The military receives word that Godzilla's on his way towards San Francisco and will be approaching from near the Golden Gate Bridge. Admiral Sten then realizes in horror that there are still buses on that bridge. We then cut to Sam Brody's bus to see the boy sitting inside looking at the military blockade around him. Suddenly, the entire sequence has this new level of suspense and weight as we realize Godzilla's approach could spell disaster for the child. I believe this strategy goes hand in hand with the idea of raising stakes over the course of a sequence and over the course of a film. The concept of a twist is pretty self-explanatory. When there is an unexpected reveal that takes the audience off guard despite having earlier hints towards its arrival, it can be very exciting. Godzilla King of the Monsters uses this concept very well already, as the reveal that Emma Russell is with Ellen Jonah is able to recontextualize her entire characterization previously in the movie and adds a new level of depth to all her previous scenes. It then propels the characters in new directions as they're forced to reconcile with the consequences of her actions. The final point Filmento lays out is theme. A scene that relates back to the theme of the movie will almost always be more resonant than a scene that doesn't. The reason the reason the ending of 1954's Godzilla is so impactful is because it's so rich with thematic nuance. The film about criticizing nuclear armament then asks its audience to sympathize with the use of an even worse weapon of mass destruction, making its creator the ultimate hero of the film. This ending works on so many different levels, by saving the day from evil and making Godzilla a victim at the exact same time. Sarazawa's tragic sacrifice is made all the more moving by the fact that it's done in service of the film's themes. Sarazawa was aware of how untrustworthy trustworthy humankind is with something of that power, and so he chooses to take his own life in order to avoid giving it to them. For me, there were a few other details that I think go into creating a perfect kaiju sequence. I believe that in order for a scene to be perfect, it must also hold weight for the characters involved by teaching the audience something new about the characters or having the characters realize something new about themselves or each other. Going back to my video on Godzilla x Kong's potential, I discussed a scene in War of the Gargantuas in which Sonda realizes 
realizes his brother Gyra is a murderer who must be stopped. This scene is so great because it taught Sanda a horrific lesson and also deepens our understanding of his character by revealing how far he's willing to go to protect people. Another ingredient that makes a kaiju sequence perfect is the use of scale and majesty. Kong Skull Island's incredible introduction to Kong does this better than almost any other film. The slow pan up from the ground to reveal the unfathomable figure in front of the characters blocked out by the sun as if he is beyond comprehension is an all-time film history moment for me. The best way to accomplish this is through the use of familiar objects. While Skull Island never sees the kaiju appear in a city, it does place them in direct reference to the human cast, helicopters, and even boats as a way to ground the audience in the world and give them a sense of context. But the best way this can be used is by placing the kaiju in a city. While Godzilla feels truly horrific at sea in Godzilla Minus One, it's not until he appears in Ginza that the audience truly feels how enormous he really is. The final ingredient is one that Ashiro Honda knew to use very deliberately throughout his original Godzilla. In order to make every destruction sequence hold so much more weight, we were grounded in a world with characters we could recognize. We first meet some strangers on a train, and their conversation does little to progress the plot and doesn't add much to the story. But what their conversation does do is root us in a world with people who feel real and gives us a face to the victims of Godzilla. The people on the subway are later present when Godzilla first appears off the coast of Tokyo, and by knowing them already, it adds a whole new level of weight to the scene. All of this culminates 54 minutes into Godzilla King of the Monsters, when we arrive at a 15 minute and 19 second sequence that I believe encapsulates the perfect kaiju sequence and works as a perfect kaiju short film in and of itself. While the film has received lots of criticism, people mostly always praise this sequence, because it combines everything perfectly. For the first time since 1956, Michael Doherty puts the fear back in Rodan. Many consider the 1954 Godzilla film to be a true horror movie and the closest the kaiju genre has ever come to that. I believe that 1956's Rodan is more successful at making a horror movie. The film is truly terrifying at times, as a result of how helpless the characters feel in comparison to Rodan. Godzilla King of the Monsters remembers this and places Rodan dead in the center of a populated island where the inhabitants have little to nowhere to go in order to get away from him. This also returns Rodan to a city, grounding him with an excellent sense of scale. There is an even better version of the scene where Rodan fights humanity that plays out in the film's original animatics. This sequence utilizes the human scale far better and draws out the suspense in different and exciting ways while amplifying the horror elements of the movie through the use of scale. While I do think some elements of this are better, this is not the superior sequence overall because it doesn't incorporate all the elements that go into making a perfect kaiju sequence as well. The scene, while exciting, doesn't reveal anything new about our characters as clearly as the movie does. The Rodan emergence sequence is one of the most effective uses of human scale in the entire film and is also one of the most underrated uses of human scale in the MonsterVerse overall. The scene is constantly grounding us in different points of view from different people viewing the situation from all angles. We see how the fishermen are impacted by this, how the public on the street is impacted, how the GT members in the air deal with it, how Monarch is handling it, and how the jet fighters high in the sky are approaching it. Of all of these perspectives, it's the moments on the ground that stand out the most. This is aided by another feature of what goes into making the perfect kaiju sequence as we are introduced to a grandmother and her grandson at the start of the scene, and they later return during Rodan's attack to give weight to his victims. Rather than rooting for the survival of a faceless man who we are just seeing for the first time, we are rooting for the survival of a boy and his grandma who we were introduced to a few minutes before. It's a very small but effective strategy. It's helped by the fact that they are being saved by the G-team members we've spent the whole film with, and who are now in the same danger as everyone else. The previous death of Dr. Graham, a legacy character, adds a whole new level of stakes to the movie and makes their struggle feel even more real as any number of them stand a chance of getting killed. We not only see how the humans on the ground feel about the kaiju, but we are also frequently reminded of how our main characters feel about them as well. The cutaways to the people on the Argo jet are used very effectively. The entire sequence plays with the idea of a ticking bomb and raises the stakes better than almost any other in the MonsterVerse as well. Rodan's Awakening is given a slow and horrific buildup that utilizes sound design super well. We know there's a titan in the volcano and that Emma has just triggered the orca, which makes the evacuation feel even more urgent. The eruption of the volcano ties thematically back into the film's message about mankind's helplessness in the face of nature and is handled with the gravity and weight that a titan emergence should be. As if the inevitable destruction caused by Rodan waking up isn't enough, Monarch learns that Ghidorah is inbound with just little over two minutes before he arrives, another ticking clock. Mark Russell, in a scene that further demonstrates his 
his awareness of kaiju behavior and deepens his character, realizes Monarch needs to act fast in order to save more lives than Rodan alone will be able to take. A battle between the two titans could level the entire island, so Mark makes the active choice that Monarch should engage Rodan in order to lead him to Ghidorah. Serizawa agrees, and the choice has officially been made. The destruction Rodan causes to the city as he flies over it is another staple of kaiju sequences that is always great to see. It's elevated again by the way Michael Doherty relates the devastating shockwaves Rodan causes to those of nuclear explosions, tying Rodan back into the themes the character was born from in the first place. The whole sequence is helped by amazing visuals, fantastic special effects, and intense and memorable music from Bear McCreary. We then move to the sky, exploring a different terrain for this battle. Rodan's battle with the Monarch air support is intense and electric. It has perfected the craft of taking Kaiju to the sky by placing Rodan in a dogfight, not unlike what happens towards the end of the 1956 film. New digital technology allows us to explore new angles and see different maneuvers previously unattainable in a practical effects world. The entire scene isn't just fearful and intense, it also has a sense of humor and levity to it. Even if at times it is an ironic and dark sense of humor, this still helps to keep the sequence fresh for the audience and avoid burnout. Rodan's battle demonstrates his abilities, intelligence, and personality very well, while introducing some truly iconic and new moves to a franchise and a character that is over 60 years old. This sequence also represents the best of both worlds as we move across the entire spectrum of kaiju entertainment in less than seven minutes. First starting with Rodan's appearance as a force of nature, then seeing the destruction of a cityscape before moving on to a kaiju versus military sequence, this brief stretch of the film encapsulates the entire first era of kaiju filmography. Then a shift happens as Rodan and Ghidorah enter each other's proximity and we move from a man versus nature to a nature versus nature conflict. There's no need to worry about if you're a kaiju versus humanity fan who enjoys the serious destruction scenes or if you're a fan of the bombastic kaiju fights because this scene has them both. Again, Doherty demonstrates how he has refined the craft of aerial combat in the kaiju medium with an intense matchup between Rodan and Ghidorah. This is a good place to mention Doherty's eyes for visuals. While King of the Monsters earns its fair share of criticism over the chaotic cinematography, this sequence utilizes camera movement super well and also represents the undeniable fact that regardless of how someone feels about the movie's camera work overall, the movie presents the viewer with some of the most beautiful, well-designed, painting-like visuals out of the entire genre. These screenshots or moments are instantly iconic and recognizable as being from this film and truly are stunning to behold. Rodan's fight with Ghidorah, while brief, does a good job about telling us about each kaiju as characters and shows us more about them through their movements alone. While Rodan is clearly a better flyer, he can't compete with Ghidorah's unnatural movements and overall power. Ghidorah is able to pull off this crazy upside-down flight while still outmaneuvering Rodan with his heads before utilizing all three of them to immobilize Rodan and then whipping out the gravity beams to end the fight once and for all. While the primary Rodan scene has ended here, the film has seamlessly slipped into the next sequence, which is the Mass Awakening. Keeping the momentum up, the film doesn't lose its sense of intensity at all as we move from one obstacle to the next. Just as the kaiju threat seems vanquished, we are introduced to the damaged Osprey, piloted by the G-Team soldiers with the civilians inside, including the grandmother and grandson from earlier. It doesn't have much time before it shorts out and crashes into the ocean, giving us another ticking clock. The bay doors are locked, and so they can't just easily solve the problem. Mark's decision about needing to act in order to save the Ospreys reveals more about who he is and gives him another active choice to make. Later on, despite Mark hating Sam, he still saves his life, again demonstrating that he truly is a good person beneath his rough exterior. Once it seems that the threat of Rodan has been neutralized, another threat in the form of the Oxygen Destroyer is introduced, adding a much more intense and literal ticking clock to the entire sequence. If the Osprey isn't rescued in time, the Argo Jet won't have the time it needs to outrun the blast radius. This is the twist, first foreshadowed during the news report at the start of the film, and then again during the sequence at the Senate hearing about the Titans. Mark's solution to the Baydor problem continues to show his priorities and how they differ from those around him, and also shows how far he'll go to help others. And again, after this, we're given a brief moment of levity, as it seems things are calming down, before we're introduced to our final threat of the sequence, as Ghidorah returns, ready to destroy the Argo Jet. As Ghidorah approaches, we're put back in the perspective of humanity and given a deep sense of fear of the Titan, only to have Godzilla triumphantly appear to save them. Godzilla's appearance does so much for this scene, not only taking us to our final terrain for the sequence and completing our journey from land to air to sea, but also deepening the thematic connection to the movie and revealing more about the characters. Godzilla's arrival reminds us that he is a 
power to restore balance and shows that nature often has a way of correcting itself when mankind isn't intervening. Godzilla saving the jet also forces Mark to reconcile with the fact that although Godzilla tragically and accidentally killed his son, he doesn't mean the world harm. The battle at sea isn't intense because we're on the edge of our seat about who's gonna win, but rather because we're on the edge of our seat about who's going to lose when that ticking clock runs out and the oxygen destroyer goes off. The next twist of the sequence is that Godzilla is actually capable of pulling off the victory here, as he has a complete handle of the situation and even decapitates one of Ghidorah's heads before gunning for the other two. Before Godzilla can get a chance to save the day and put all of this to bed, he is hit with the oxygen destroyer and pushed to the brink of death, giving Ghidorah an opportunity to escape and become stronger than ever. Godzilla's defeat here is the ultimate thematic statement for the movie. Humanity is on track to push the planet to the brink of extinction, and anytime nature has the opportunity to heal itself, mankind steps in or makes things worse. It's only through finding a way to coexist with nature that the planet will start to heal. We then arrive at what might be the most iconic sequence of the movie, as Ghidorah perches on top of a volcano, regenerating his head in an awesome twist both on the character from the franchise history and on the Hydra from Greek mythology, and then Ghidorah causes a mass awakening, unleashing titans all across the entire planet and sending the world into chaos. Rodan finally returns and bows to Ghidorah, cementing him as the new king of the monsters in the wake of Godzilla. This is the final twist of the knife in the gut of the viewer as the title has now been stripped from Godzilla who first earned it in 1956 and given to his all-time rival. The entire scene utilizes fan service like this as a tool rather than as a crutch incredibly well with loving tributes all throughout. Throughout the entire sequence, the characters have been on a losing streak. Every single time they gain some ground, something else happens to set them back even further. While showing the escalation of stakes and driving characters to further degrees of desperation is an effective tool, if it isn't balanced against anything, it can become dull and burn the audience out. And so we arrive in China for the final statement of the sequence. Mothra's rebirth is handled with so much majesty and grace and provides the viewer with a new sense of hope. It raises them up and is the perfect counterstatement to the violent eruption that was Rodan's awakening. Just as we enter the second half of Act 2 and we have lost one of our heroes, we are introduced to another. Hope is reborn and we see Ghidorah still has a challenger who will be able to help. Rodan's awakening sequence in Godzilla King of the Monsters kicks off what I believe is one of the best sequences in the history of the genre and something so effective that it can work as a short film in and of itself. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end that are all very satisfying. It's a dynamic and complex set of scenes that takes the audience on a journey through all of what makes kaiju films so great. We see the human scale and fear needed to make the titans so enormous. Rodan's awakening is treated with majesty and horror at the same time. The following city destruction kicks off an epic battle that takes the viewer from the ground to the sky and evolves from a man versus kaiju to a kaiju versus kaiju conflict. The threats are constantly increasing and coming in new forms that introduce ticking clock elements of suspense and heighten the themes of the movie. Familiar faces return time and time again and add a new level of intensity to the drama unfolding, and the characters are constantly forced to make hard choices that reveal more about themselves, each other, and their relationships to the Titans and to Godzilla. And the entire thing is just so kick-ass. Whenever I think of the film, this is the sequence I think of, and it's no wonder that this sequence earns so much praise when people discuss this movie. Rodan's Awakening is fantastic because it represents the best of both worlds and shows how kaiju films can be dramatic, moody, and terrifying, while also being exciting, fun, and full of hope. Thank you guys all so much for tuning into this one. This is actually the second time I've had to record this because the audio got corrupted, so uh, that was a big F in the chat moment for me. I really appreciate all the support I get on these videos, and I hope you found this interesting. I would love to hear what you think the perfect kaiju sequence is down below. What are some of your favorites? By the way, this isn't my number one favorite, nor are these the only ingredients that I think can be used to create the perfect kaiju sequence, but I'd love to hear what ingredients you think go into it and what your favorite kaiju sequences are throughout the entire filmography of the kaiju genre. I also just love this Rodan sequence and wanted to give it its flowers because it's so great. The Mass Awakening as a whole is such a great moment in the movie, but the Rodan thing in particular I wanted to give a highlight because Rodan deserves some love. I know some people were disappointed in the fact that he wasn't stronger in the scene, but you know what, that ultimately doesn't do anything for the movie overall. All it does is drag the drama out a little longer, so I get why they didn't extend the fight with Ghidorah. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. If you want to support the Patreon, you can use the link in the description below. I really appreciate all the support I get over there, and by supporting the Patreon, you are directly supporting this channel and making sure that I can keep making videos like this for you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I will see you guys next time for the
the next one, D-Man out.